Okay, um, again, hello everyone and good evening. Uh, welcome to the final lecture session of the second Critique Conference. Um, again, our theme for the whole lecture series this year is entitled From Wisdom Special Workshop to Factories of Knowledge, the Place of University in Culture and in Society. I am Jesse Joshua Lino from the Department of Philosophy of the University of Santo Tomas. And along with me is uh, Mr. Aldrin Manalestas. I we will be moderating for today's lecture. Uh, let us begin, perhaps, uh, with a short prayer. And let us put ourselves in the presence of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, thank you, Almighty God, for this day. And uh, we hope that you will guide us every day. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Now, before we move on to our lecture proper, let us hear once again the opening remarks for this session from one of the editors-in-chief of Critique, an online journal of philosophy, our very own Dr. Paolo A. Bolanos. Hello, Dr. Pao. Hello, uh, Jesse. Thank you very much. I hope that, um, uh, that I'm clear. Yes, Doc. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and last uh, lecture uh, in the second critic conference with the theme uh, from Wisdom Special Workshop to fact Factories of Knowledge, the Place of University in Culture and Society. So as we draw closer to the end of this month-long conference, on behalf of the editorial board of Critique, an online journal of philosophy, we hope that the last four weeks have been philosophically fruitful for everyone. Um, this conference is, of course, merely part of uh, uh, the USA Department of Philosophy's uh, continuous uh, advocacy in defense of the role of the university in culture and society most especially the role of the humanities in university education. Expect then that we will be organizing, sem uh, organizing similar events in the very near future so as not to keep our guards down and that we continue to vigilantly defend the university and spread awareness of the fundamentals of learning and teaching. Um, uh, so I would like to thank then um, uh, everyone for uh, joining us uh, uh, this evening. Thank you for going out of your way. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank our um, guest speaker for this evening, Dr. Uh, Jerry Nalusa from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lanusa, for your intellectual generosity. Uh, thank you also uh, to the USC Department of Philosophy, most especially our chair, Dr. Jovito Carino, the Faculty of Arts and Letters, uh, the USC Graduate School, and of course, uh, special thanks to the Concilium Philosophiae for their assistance. Um, my deep appreciation also goes to uh, the organizing committee for, for the hard work of the head, uh, Dr. Rainel Reyes with his team, uh, uh, Mr. Alvin Manalastas and Mr. Jesse Lino. Uh, of course, my, spe uh, my special thanks also to Rainier Abenganya for conceptualizing the theme of the conference. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to again, uh, thank everyone and welcome everyone to uh, the last lecture of the second Critique Conference. So good evening and I hope that um, uh, we will have a very uh, fruitful discussion uh, this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bolaños. Um, again, may we request our participants to put your microphones in mute as the lecture is being held. And now to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Gerardo M. Lanuza is currently a professor of the Department of Sociology at University of the Philippines, Teleman teaching courses on sociology of religion and sociology of education, youth culture, and sociological theory. He received his master's and bachelor's degree in sociology from the UP Diliman, where he also received his doctorate degree in education. He is a member of the Congress of Teachers, Educators for Nationalism and Democracy, and the Alliance for Concerned Teachers. Today, 
which is two days after the 35th anniversary of the first EDSA revolution, uh, he, he will be presenting a very timely lecture entitled Neo-Fascism as the Apparatus of Neoliberal Attack on Education um, Towards a Pedagogy of Resistance. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Uh, Gerardo M. Lanuza. Hello po, Sir Jerry. Uh, magandang gabi, uh, Jesse. Magandang gabi. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, si, ano, no, yung USC Department of Philosophy for inviting me, uh, the journal especially, uh, hosting this conference, uh, Critique. And uh, congratulations, no? this is your second uh, conference. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, Rainiel Reyes and uh, si uh, Aldrin, uh, whom I had uh, constant uh, communication with, with regard to this conference. Okay, and, and of course, I would like to thank all the uh, participants who are joining this uh, online uh, conference uh, this evening. Maraming salamat. Okay, so tonight, uh, what I'm going to do is to, uh, is to provide a, uh, I think this is the last one, no? uh, um, a lecture on, actually a sharing on neo-fascism as the apparatus of neoliberalist attacks on education towards a pedagogy of resistance. I would, I would have called it uh, towards a non-fascist or anti-fascist uh, uh, pedagogy, okay? What I'm going to do uh, in this uh, lecture sharing uh, is, uh, by the way, I'm so happy with the, the, the theme of the second conference of Critique. Uh, I, I, I think uh, the, the, the Department of Philosophy has uh, geared towards uh, multidisciplinarity and uh, embracing, uh, in fact, transdisciplinarity in a sense that it welcomes uh, many disciplines within its uh, conference and field, other than strictly the traditional definition of philosophy. Uh, I am not a philosopher. I am coming from the discipline of social sciences and uh, sociology uh, specifically. So my approach here would be very uh, social scientific, sociological, but I would try to put some philosophical slants and, and readings and interpretations as we go along. Okay, so what I'm going to do tonight uh, in this lecture is that I'm going to provide you with a very short definition of what neoliberalism is as a philosophical and economic ideology. Second, I'm going to discuss uh, the impact or the consequences of uh, neoliberalism or neoliberal restructuring of the economy on education. And then I will zero in to Philippine educational system. And then I'm going to uh, analyze or provide an analysis of uh, how uh, neoliberalism has structured uh, higher learning uh, in the Philippines in such a way, uh, especially in relation to K plus 12 uh, program and, and the CHED uh, redefinition and restructuring of, of the curriculum uh, in relation to K, K to 12. And I will try to show uh, uh, in the later part, I'm going to connect it and show how this is connected with uh, fascism. I know some of you will contest and debate the meaning of fascism. Probably you would think that is very inappropriate, that's too European, but uh, I'm going to explain later on why I, I choose this. There are other terms and concepts and labels that could have been, that I could have employed, but I, I prefer this one. It's very, uh, Political, it's politically loaded, and then uh, I'm going to uh, at the end uh, develop uh, an alternative uh, pedagogical uh, uh, vision that is grounded in uh, uh, progressive education plus uh, reconstructionism of George Counts uh, in order to uh, combat and to redefine and to rearm to weaponize liberal arts education uh, as 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 um, as a weapon, as as an instrument that can be used by the university in order to uh, at least arrest the creeping barbarism and uh, vulgar uh, brutalization of higher learning caused by neoliberal ideology. Okay, so let's let let me begin with a very short definition of what neoliberal ideology is. Many of you probably would say that neoliberal ideology is just a concocted by Marxist, leftist, etc., philosophers, sociologists, social scientists, including those from the humanities and leftist cultural analysts. 
but I think that uh, there has already been a growing body of literature that has established the validity of uh, this concept. Okay, and I think the, the best way to start with is to begin with the definition by David Harvey. But my favorite take of, uh, take of point here is by uh, Lost Boy. No? He is he's an educator. And he, he believes, and I agree with him, that neoliberalism is uh, specifically an economic process as well as a broader configuration of society. Okay, as an economic process, taking from uh, David Harvey, a uh, geographer, uh, he thinks that, uh, and I quote, uh, it, it, in essence, uh, neoliberal, neoliberalism simply means liberating the individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets and free trade. What Harvey, what David Harvey is saying from an economic point of view is that you can only develop your economy if you open it, try to get rid of uh, state interventions as well as uh, obstacles to market forces. He's referring to non-market non forces, um, making it difficult for capitalist traders, business interests, corporations, to do uh, to accumulate capital uh, within the market. So to, to do that uh, from uh, from a uh, economic point of view, uh, rational choice theory is to liberate the individual's entrepreneurial freedoms. Meaning you have to develop the individual skills to take risk, to take responsibility, to be resilient, flexible, so that he could cope with all the challenges, hazards, as well as risks posed by by um, the competition, by the stiff and rugged competition that would have been that would be unleashed by the market forces, and that would eventually lead to prosperity. Well, of course, uh, at least as as for Milton Friedman uh, and Frederick Hayek would have us believed. Okay, uh, okay. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay. So for neoliberalism to develop, uh, I would not. I would not discuss here the, the difference between classical liberalism and neoliberalism. Okay, it has been discussed already in, in many literature. So I assume that uh, we have uh, familiarity with that. Okay, but I will tackle that uh, in passing later on. Okay, so um, according to uh, scholars uh, studying neoliberalism, for for neoliberalism to progress and to take root and to to develop fully. It has to create uh, the fourth revolution, which is called the, uh, well, of course, the, the, the last revolution is the industrial revolution. And now we have, that, that would be the third. For Toffler, that would be the second, uh, the first, the second, third, and we have now the fourth wave. Okay. What, what uh, scholars would say is that, uh, especially, Neoliberalism happened basically uh, historically in short. Okay, I'll just recapitulate. In short, in 1980s, uh, with the election of the popular popular leaders in, in England, uh, Margaret Thatcher and in the US, Ronald Reagan, uh, it, 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 was, it was a response. There, this ideology uh, embraced by Reaganomics and Thatcherism is a response to the decline and to the dead end created by Keynesian economics. In other words, the crisis of welfare state. So the problem is, how do we minimize state spending at the same time accumulating capital without further investment? So the solution here is uh, we have to relocate most of our businesses, and now we have outsourcing uh, outside the, the imperialist uh, but well, of course, uh, some sociologists would call this a, from the center to the satellites and periphery. So from the center to the periphery, you have to transfer that. But how do you coordinate this so-called disorganized capitalism, to use the words of Scott Lash and Mike Featherstone? The only way to do that is to create another revolution, uh, not political or economic, but this one is technological revolution. And this is called the fourth uh, revolution. And this is the advent of information or knowledge society. In order to coordinate uh, the, the outsource, the outsourced uh, investments, as well as uh, to manage uh, complex, chaotic information, networks, uh, value chains, and supplies around the world, globally, 
through the internet. So that is that is why what drove the internet basically is not is not just technological revolution. It was a solution uh, uh, taken over, hijacked by neoliberal uh, think tanks, economists, and scholars, uh, and 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 policymakers and bureaucrats within the government in order to to spread uh, global cap uh, capitalism globally or worldwide. So. Uh, with the advent of knowledge society, what we have right now is the proliferation of different sources of knowledge. We have the Wikipedia, we have the Google, and we have so many uh, sites, torrents, peer-to-peer uh, -peer sites, direct downloads, free, and uh, some are paid that you can actually uh, download your materials. But not only that. There are so many, I, I, the, the information or knowledge society has enabled the creation of so many centers of knowledge production outside the universities, outside the formal schooling apparatus or apparatuses. And it has created the crisis for the, for, for, for the university. Why? Because so many students, so many young people, especially Filipinos, would rather listen to uh, media social influencers. Uh, they would rather tune in to fake uh, media outfits to get their news about the government, about the history of uh, the martial law under Marcos, rather than reading scholarly works, books, even e-books uh, written by scholars on, on Marcos dictatorship or the, dark, the darkest years of our uh, history, the, the history of our nation. So what, what we have right now is that expert knowledge is no longer the monopoly of universities and higher learning institutions. So we have a crisis right now. M many of our students, what, especially you, you will notice that they will cite uh, sources and references from websites that, not, that, that, that are not even scholarly or educational, but coming from, from uh, uh, icons, social media icons, celebrities, in order to buttress and support and reinforce their own uh, views about social and political economic issues. So this is the after effect. This is the uh, consequences of the knowledge society. We have more knowledge, but knowledge is pluralized. It is pluralized. Uh, it is. Uh, we have so many gods now. Uh, so from monotheism, one university, we all get all our knowledge from scientists and, and, and PhD holders from universities sanctified by the gatekeepers of the academic community. Now, uh, our students are, in fact, consulting um, psychiatrists that are not even uh, officially recognized as, as psychiatrists. Okay. They are consulting guidance counselors that are not even uh, uh, officially accredited by institutions that are giving them advice about sexuality, their love life, personal life, and how to cope with their crisis, uh, personal and psychological crisis. YouTube has become the best uh, teaching machine that can rival the university, that can in fact rival the best teach that we have in the university. So that is our situation. Okay, so we move on to the next uh, slide. <laughs> Please. All right. So with that, given the fact that uh, capitalism has to, uh, global capitalism has to mutate into a neoliberal uh, uh, period or phase in order for, the, for, for it to survive and to accumulate more and survive the crisis of welfare state that, uh, and, and capital accumulation, uh, what it, uh, it has created a, a, a new apparatus and a new revolution called the fourth industrial revolution. And the Philippine, Philippine society and Filipino people, uh, our youth, our students, including our teachers, our fellow faculty uh, members, uh, our workers in the educational sector are not, are not uh, immune from this uh, onslaught of uh, the knowledge uh, uh, society or information highway. And so we are all connected into that. According to the We Are Social uh, Food Suite, uh, so, no? release their annual digital report, which gives a global overview of the number of online users 
uh, it, the, 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 the survey, global survey says that uh, Philippine, Philippine, the Philippines, our country is number two in terms of the highest number of people who have ever liked or part of a brand company or celebrity on a social networking site. In other words, our students and including our teachers are, are, are not even following uh, the right, they're not even reading books written by, by our authors, by, by, by philosophers. No. They would rather consult uh, social media influencers and um, celebrities, quote the celebrities, copy paste the lyrics of the songs of, uh, of Blackpink, of Momoland, etc., K-pop, uh, Taylor Swift, uh, Catriona Gray has even replaced political philosophers for attacking the, the authoritarianism of the Duterte regime. So what, what, what it means, what it translates to is that we are spending about nine hours and 29 minutes. And, and for the last year, it, it has today, it has to this year or last year, it has increased to 10 hours and two minutes, the highest in the world. So in other words, from 2019, 2019 we are second. In 2020, we had become number one. We are spending 10 hours, two minutes this year uh, on social media, the highest in the world. Now, does it mean that we are literate? Does it mean that we are uh, computer savvy or literate? No, not necessarily. Having access to the net is not necessarily translatable to uh, media literacy or knowledgeability about how to use information, how to analyze it and put it in a proper context and put it within a, a larger framework that would make it uh, meaningful and make sense and connect it with the wider issues of our society. It is not necessarily so. So the digital divide, that is the unequal access to the net is now compounded with, you have access, but you have no uh, expertise or skills on how to use that knowledge, how to use that access in order to develop critical uh, mindedness or critical consciousness in order to use that and harness that data information uh, to, to criticize, to, to create an alternative to, to, to the status quo, to the state of affairs of our nation and, and, and of the world. Okay, so next slide, please. So that is why, according to Henry Giroux, uh, a Canadian a critical pedagogue and teacher, he says that uh, with the advent of information uh, society, knowledge society, information highway, with the advent of network society, what we have created is political illiteracy. And this is quite paradoxical, if not ironic, because uh, supposed to be you, you have so many, you have, you have accumulated so much knowledge and we have so many data and information that we can access in seconds, in nanoseconds, in minutes, uh, in, the, in the fastest way possible. Well, of course, we are, have not, we, we are lagging behind uh, the speed uh, when it comes to internet access in Asia and the world. But nevertheless, according to Henry Giroux, uh, we have produced uh, informal, this informal educational apparatuses uh, had been hijacked by neo-fascist groups and individuals to spew conservative and militaristic ideologies, extolling, extolling the silencing, silencing, if not the killings of state enemies. And this is very, very, very true for Philippine society. If you go through the videos, if you go through the uh, posts, uh, live feeds on, 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 on the Facebook, on YouTube, you will notice that, wow, there are so many... Uh, um, new, if not fake accounts, fake media outfits, spewing lies, spreading uh, uh, error, uh, fake news and, and, and uh, this deceptive information about this government. Um, and, and there are many blogs. Uh, I, I should not name it, name it here because I think you, should, or you are familiar with that. If you have trolls, you also have an organized networks that uh, spew deceptive information, uh, disinformation in order to uh, uh, legitimize, justify, and, and further um, support the current uh, trust of, uh, of, the, uh, of the government 
to silence to silence its critiques. Because of that, today for Jeru, and I quote, truth is confused with opinions. In philosophy, it's it's very interesting that truth <laughs> truth is so different from opinion. Plato already uh, uh, distinguished between knowledge, opinion, and truth. But today, uh, you cannot distinguish hopes and lies become normalized at the highest level of the government. In fact, the government deliberately uh, disseminate and, and spread lies and deception, especially when it comes to red tagging, witch hunting, anti-communist hysteria by attacking uh, universities and schools. We have 38 schools being red tagged and UP has been singled out as the uh, largest uh, hub or uh, center for the recruitment of terrorists uh, among its uh, students. In other words, we teach in UP, the University of the Philippines, we, the faculty there, are supposed to be teaching our students how to become terrorists, how to be members of the New People's Army, the Communist Party of the Philippines, which is quite ridiculous and preposterously absurd. Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, slide, please. <laughs> So what we have right now is a post-truth society, according to many sociologists. Uh, the distinction between truth and post-truth society is that in a society, in, 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 the, in traditional society, I, not traditional versus modern, but uh, traditional in a sense that before the post-truth society came, uh, truth from a Cartesian or uh, from Descartes' point of view is that I think, therefore I am. In fact, the Cartesian motto or the Cartesian slogan of I think therefore I am, uh, cogito ergo sum, is the slogan of li uh, liberal arts education. And this is the foundation of modern uh, modernist university education. Uh, what it means is that before you believe, you have to doubt everything. You have to, to, to distance yourself, to use uh, the words of uh, uh, Edmund Husserl, you have to bracket, you have to perform uh, an epoch uh, in order to uh, analyze and study uh, the, 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 the issue at hand, uh, to, to, to verify and to analyze the veracity of any belief that you want to have. But from the very beginning, in your journey of knowing, uh, you should be skeptical, not only skeptical, but you should doubt. Doubt everything because doubt is the beginning of knowledge, according to Abelard. But in the post-truth society, that is no longer possible. Why? Because I think, therefore, I am of Descartes has been replaced by I believe, therefore, I am right. Simply because you think that it is true, therefore, it is right. Simply because you think that Moka Uson or any DDS uh, spokesperson or Panelo or Harry Roque uh, believe them because uh, they, they're there. They're, what they're saying is rhetorically persuasive. Therefore, it is true. So again, according to Henry Giroux, and I quote him, politicians endlessly lie, knowing that the public is addicted to exhortation, emotional outburst, and sensationalism. What makes Duterte so popular? What makes people listen to Duterte's rant, uh, late evening shows? Uh, with rumblings and uh, those absurd uh, and, and peppered with uh, uh, insults and, and uh, cussing and cursing is that Roque is right. Sanay ang Pilipino dito. And Duterte is riding on that cultural uh, propensity of the Filipinos uh, to, to listen, to be glued to the speaker simply because the speaker is uh, is is propounding uh, lewd, rude, and and uh, uh, exaggerated claims and very antagonistic, uh, misogynistic and hypermasculine uh, claims. Image selling, according to Geru, uh, now entails lying on principle. In fact, what what makes Duterte so popular is that he sells himself as someone who does not observe public uh, ethics and moral, he has no moral qualms about attacking his, his enemies, especially women and religious and the church and religious people, making it easier for politics to dissolve into entertainment, pathology, and a unique brand of 
criminality. And that is what that 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 is what the the people are looking for for Duterte. That's what they admired from Duterte. That Duterte is so straightforward, so honest. He speaks his mind. Uh, uh, he, he speaks the language of uh, street or slang language, the vulgar language of ordinary people. But but but, but the the question here is that is that the truth? Uh, is he telling us the truth? Is it is it warranted assertion? Uh, Etc. Okay, so that is the big question. Next spot. Next slide, please. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, with this, uh, with this advent of uh, port industrial revolution and the creation of knowledge society and that knowledge society or information highway created, uh, basically to 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 support the spread and coordination of capital around the world. It has also affected our educational system. Now I'm going to uh, discuss now the impact, the restructuring, as well as the consequences of this knowledge uh, uh, revolution on education, especially on higher learning institutions. So we have the restructuring of Philippine education as a result of this neoliberal uh, reform. Uh, years before the pandemic, our educational system was restructured along neoliberal orientation. The K-12 program that was touted as the uh, centerpiece of the last regime's uh, uh, program and continued under the Duterte regime is supposed uh, enacted through Republic Act 10105 uh, redirects the educational direction of Philippine educational system towards the new liberal agenda. But what is that new liberal agenda uh, other than the very vague and abstract definition uh, of Harvey, that it tries to liberate the entrepreneurial freedoms of, of uh, individuals so that they could uh, transact freely uh, in the market guided by the market forces and guided by the invisible hand of Adam Smith. Okay, let's see what it, may, what, what it entails. So next, Paul, next uh, slide. What it entails, if you look at the official definition of the DepEd Department of Education on what is the goal of K-12. The aim of education is less to train students to critically evaluate the government policies and actions, as well as engage in the discussion of social issues, but to confine learning to purely academic excellence and compete with other privatized schools for branding, for logo. Every graduate of K-12 program according to the official definition of, of, of the government, are supposed to, supposed to have the following. Information, media, and technology skills, learning and innovation skills, effective communication skills, life and career skills. These are the supposed to be outcomes or the skills and knowledge that are supposed to be acquired, developed, uh, imbibed, inculcated to the students by K-12 educational uh, reform, but uh, it, it, because it, it is supposed to uh, make us competitive globally, it, it is supposed to internal, internationalize and globalize our educational system because we are the only uh, two of the remaining countries in the world that are not implementing this uh, K-12 program. But uh, again, is this the end of education? just to have information, media, and technology skills, just to have learning and innovation skills? It, it, is, it, are these outcomes defined by the government and the state, by the Department of Education, uh, supposed to be enough and adequate and the be all and end all of education? No, I don't think so. But they are emphasizing this simply because they want all the graduates of K-12, when they graduate, they need not proceed to college or uh, uh, post K-12 education, the baccalaureate degree, or probably the MA and the PhD and the post -baccalaure or the post baccalaureate degree, but in simply just to work. So what is the purpose of this? The purpose of this, uh, I will discuss in the next slide. So, okay, so next slide, please. The purpose of this is to commercialize education. If there is something that it is a concept that will describe or encapsulize what neoliberal reform of education, it is commercialization of education. 
education is a public good. It is supposed to be non-tradable. Non it cannot be sold. But if, if, if you put the market or if you allow the market to define what education is, that is what Habermas would call as the colonization of the life world. Education is supposed to be a, 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 a part of the, private, uh, of the public sphere. And, and, and as, a, as a part of the public sphere, it's, it's, it's medium or media of communication. It's rationality and truth and cognitive competence. But once you allow the market to dominate, not only dominate, but to define what, what education, how education should progress, what education is, and how we are going to evaluate the end of education? Wow! What what the consequence here? The consequence here is is, is so dramatic and disastrous for for the for the educational system. When graduates of K to twelve education enter our universities, not only UP but USC, the basic education had indoctrinated them to become good and docile workers. The government has always accused radical teachers, progressive teachers, especially at the University of the Philippines, of indoctrinating students to become communists, to become members of the New People's Army. But they had never questioned that they are also indoctrinating. Actually, they, in, they have indoctrinated their students, our young people, to become good and docile workers. But we don't question that. Why? Because philosophically, they assume. Well, of course, in philosophy, you, you cannot assume everything is up for uh, contestation and disagreement. So they basically assume that docile, to be docile and to be good workers are values that are normal and morally, ethically justifiable and the highest good, higher than the eudaimonia of Aristotle. They expect larger monetary returns. Our students, therefore, when they enter the school, when they enter the universities, they choose a career uh, well, of course, for those who, who took uh, uh, K to 12 uh, and passed K to 12 and go to the universities, this only refers to them. But how about those who failed or who stopped uh, with K to 12 because they are already ready to work? But that is still questionable because according to employers, they will not impact. Uh, studies would show, initial studies would show that uh, many graduates of K to 12 uh, are landing in jobs that are, have, are very low paying. They are contractual and they are being abused, exploited by, 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 their, their, by their employers because they only finished uh, K to 12. So for students who enter the universities through STEM, business, uh, UMS, and social science uh, tracks, they expect larger monetary returns in exchange for shorter education or much be higher return for length, uh, lengthier time spent for college. And this, is, this goes through for parents. And many middle-class parents are like this. They see their children as an investment. So they invest a lot on their children. And because they invest a lot on, on their children, they also invest a lot on their education. Why? Because they expect that when they invest a lot, they will profit more. They will accumulate more. In other words, they have to delay their gratification so that after four years, they will be able to squeeze uh, profits from their uh, from their uh, uh, children, sons and daughters, and and the, so their sons and daughters, of course, will uh, reciprocate to that because they had been indoctrinated to become good and docile workers, obedient children, obedient students, and questioning uh, learners, which is the antithesis of. Uh, democratic education being proposed by John Green. In a society of, of scarce, uh, scarce, sorry, the spelling's wrong, uh, scarce resources and limited social mobility, education is often seen as the magic key to get out of poverty. So if you ask our students, why do you take this course? Why are you take? Other than the fact that it is chosen for them by their parents, the other uh, reason is that uh, they will acquire more uh, income. And because of that, they will be able to help their parents and send their siblings to school, as well as pay the debts to their uh, families um, for sending them to good universities and higher education. But again, if you ask Plato, if you ask Aristotle, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, 
did they study for this? Did Aristotle? Did 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 even Socrates said that an unexamined life is not worth uh, living because he 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 wanted to to repay the debt, the spirits. <laughs> this is ironic, and this is this is very anti-humanistic education that is being developed and being um, inculcated to us by neoliberal restructuring of our educational system. Okay, next po, next slide. Uh, if you are not convinced that this is happening because you think that, uh, well, Sir Jerry, I, uh, I, I, you are just ranting all your criticism against this uh, abstract uh, uh, economic system, economic philosophy, but in fact, uh, uh, it, 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 it's so plural, it's so, it's so, liquid, it's so liquid and fluid that it cannot be universalized or cannot be universalized. Or generalized, but uh, this is my uh, repose to you, and this is an example, or these are examples of how our society currently um, justifies or toes the line, or toes the line of neoliberal restructuring of education. For instance, in a video module created by DepEd, the teacher on the video uh, broad broadcast under television a channel uh, funded by the government, paid by the DepEd, as the students. Our society is confronted with so many problems. What do you do? A, you're going to join the rally to criticize and change the government. B, you will just cooperate the with the government because the government is already do doing uh, its, its share or its role in solving that problem. And the answer, should be, according to the tutorial, to the video, is uh, to the uh, teaching material, is to the module, is uh, you should not join a rally. <laughs> and when this was uh, became viral on, on the YouTube and Facebook, on Twitter, uh, even the Commission on Human Rights said that blind obedience is not love of the country, just because you are not criticizing the government. That's not necessarily follow that you love your country. In fact, the highest act that you could show that you love your country is by criticizing it because you love your country. Okay? Uh, or to use the words of uh, Slavoj Zizek, the highest form of love is to insult the one you love. Uh, if that is, if you really truly love, how can you love if you cannot see the fault of the person that you love or the, or, or the faults of your government? And so another uh, a week before that, the Department of uh, uh, Environment and Natural Resources censored its uh, employees by saying this is a government bureaucracy, by saying that don't bite the hands, or don't bite the hand that feeds you. And this is also the the criticism being raised against UP professors and UP faculty. Palamunin kayo ng gobyerno. You are just being, uh, you are just bureaucrats. We are all bureaucrats and employed, being employed by the government. And so therefore, your salary and your wage are coming from the coppers of the government. And therefore, you don't have the right to criticize the government because it is the government that subsidizes you, that provides you with salary promotions, and all the benefits, including the bonuses. So just shut up, according to this criticism, being raised against faculty of state universities and colleges. Wala daw kaming utang na loob. Ingrato yung mga faculty ng SUCs and uh, state universities and colleges. The same is true with private schools. You are being housed, you are being... Uh, cared for by the institution, and then you how dare you attack the institution? That would be disloyalty. But, but what is more important? Being disloyal, being loyal, or academic freedom, or the right to, to express our dissent and radical uh, alternative, or proposing radical alternative to currently existing state of affairs. Okay, so next slide, Paul. Next slide. 
So what we have what we had right now is that we have produced a neoliberal fascist culture, a culture of fascism under the Duterte regime, in which all op oppositions, all dissents are, are silenced. Uh, the vocal critics of the government are surveilled. They are uh, monitored and, and uh, many of them disappear. They are kidnapped. And if not, uh, they are arrested. And then uh, the police frame them up and then charge them with Trump up charges. Uh, just like so many activists uh, suffering uh, and, and enduring, enduring that kind of uh, harassment coming from, from the state. So why, why? So there is, there is a contradiction here. On the one hand, neoliberalism says the government should not interfere in the market and allow the market forces to operate. On the other hand, why is it that the government has become so strong and in, in, in very assertive in its uh, panoptic biopolitical role to police and regulate society? In other words, is there a contradiction between neoliberal uh, uh, capitalism, neoliberal economic system, and fascism? There is none. You know why? in order for neoliberal capitalism to promote smoothly and realize and materialize, make, make its objectives, its essential characteristics materialize. It needs the forces of the state. It needs the government to see to it that all non-market forces that are becoming obstacles or hindrance to the smooth functioning of the market to be eliminated. This is what Pope Francis said as uh, market fundamentalism, that the state has no more role to play in the in economy, but under neoliberal philosophy, the state supports the market. It creates an enabling environment so that the market forces can operate freely without opposition. That is why Neoliberalism, or, or rather fascism, is the best arm. It's the best kind of government that is fitted, tailor fitted to create the best kind of neoliberal social order. You have the market, you have a strong state that supports the market and eliminates all the obstacles, all the hindrances. Uh, against the smooth functioning and, and the march, the marching of uh, uh, competition, the regulation, commercialization, uh, liberalization, meaning opening up of the market for free trade. So next uh, slide, Bo. So neo-fascism, okay, so probably you are now, you would like to debate on, on uh, sir, why are you using neo-fascism when, you, in fact, you can use populist authoritarianism? Uh, I don't want to use uh, populist uh, authoritarianism uh, because uh, the emphasis, the emphasis, the emphasis there is on popularity, populism, the, the strong support coming from the masses. What I want to emphasize here is the militaristic, the predominance of military power and solution, militaristic solution, and the growing influence of the military agencies and apparatuses of the government. That is why I am using neo-fascism rather than uh, authoritarian uh, populism or populist authoritarianism. Of course, Duterte is populist. Of course, Duterte is authoritarian. But what makes him neo-fascist is that he uses the military. In fact, I. I uh, I can even argue that right now we have a military junta. Duterte is the head, short of having a martial law. We have a de facto martial law, in fact, uh, undeclared martial law. Um, again, if, if you're going to ask me how I define uh, neo-fascism so that it fits Duterte, I would tell you that my definition of neo-fascism is an ideal type. If you're familiar with Max Weber, 
he says that ideal type are not essentialist definition. Rather, ideal type definition are definition created by a researcher, a sociologist, or a social scientist, a historian, um, by accentuating, emphasizing um, uh, certain uh, qualities while um, uh, uh, downplaying, or if not, set, setting aside other uh, characteristics. So my definition here is of neo-fascism is Bayberian. It's an ideal type. It doesn't mean that therefore Donald Trump is a neo-fascist. Well, there are so many, many uh, critical uh, theorists and critical pedagogue educators who think that Trump is, uh, is a, is, is a neo-fascist. Douglas Kellner, Henry Giroux, Enzo Traverso, and so many others. Uh, but I quote from uh, I quote from Henry Giroux. Giroux provided a summary of all the characteristics of classical fascism as it applies to neo. That is why it's neo. It's a new fascism, or rather, uh, Enzo Traverso calls this as post post fascism, fascism after the classical fascism of Hitler and Mussolini. Okay, uh, so it's called post. But I, I I would like to use the word neo, new fascism. Okay. A new fascism, based on the definition of uh, Faxton, uh, summarized by Geru, is uh, can be described as an open. Uh, it has several characteristics. Number one, it, it is an open assault on democracy. Okay, it's an open assault on democracy, and I think uh, that's very true for Duterte, especially its assault on Rappler, its assault on ABS-CBN. <laughs> The call for a strong man. Uh, many people think that Duterte is the best uh, leader because uh, of his iron fist uh, and that people should be disciplined. Um, it, it, this is a very interesting analysis by Douglas Kellner. He uses Eric Fromm's analysis of authoritarianism, Adorno, in order to say that uh, people are looking for, for a father, a strong father in Duterte. Uh, that is why he is very popular. No matter how how he he is so incompetent in handling the pandemic, a contempt for human weakness that's very that's very true, an obsession with hypermasculinity that's very true. Duterte even criticizes his own daughter Sarah cannot be a president because you're a woman, and he attacks Lenny Robredo using hypermasculine misogynistic. Uh, basically, in history, hypermasculinity and misogyny comes together or hand in hand with fascism. Fascism is very masculine. It's a machismo, an aggressive militarism. That's true. Check. An appeal to national greatness. You might think that, well, you cannot say there is an appeal to national greatness, Sir Jerry, because Duterte is uh, literally pimping our nation to China and pimping our nation uh, to, to Germany and U.S., for the vaccine and for loans. Well, all I can say is that actually he is pimping, but at the same time, he is uh, deploying the rhetoric of very strong uh, negotiating uh, stand or position by saying that you cannot have a BFA without giving us 16 billion per year. You cannot have our nurses if you will not give us vaccines. And that for many followers of Duterte, the so-called uh, DDS, uh, the Duterte fanatics, they would say that, uh, oh, our president is so strong. He's fighting for our, for our uh, nation, unlike uh, the past administrations. A disdain for the feminine, very true. An investment in the language of cultural decline. Yes, we're declining because of drugs, and therefore the, our system is corrupt and rotten. Our police uh, system, our criminality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Our crime, criminal uh, system uh, and, uh, is, is uh, putrescent. The disparaging of human rights, uh, wow, that's number one. The suppression of dissent, that's number one also. A propensity for violence, yes. How many times did Duterte say, napapatayin ko kayo? Or Duterte said, makita lang kita, sasampaling kita. Or he says that, uh, kapag nanglaban, patayin nyo. If they resist you, uh, go ahead, kill them. In fact, if you... He said to Marawi soldiers, "You go there. If you are in, 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 if you cannot resist the temptation and you rape someone, uh, that's okay. I will back you up." 
the suppression of dissent, propensity for violence, disdain for intellectuals. He hates, uh, Duterte hates the intellectuals, especially Chel Jokno, and, and he mocks them, not because of their philosophical stance, not because of ideological differences, but because of his teeth. A hatred of reason, fantasies of racial superiority and eliminate, eliminationist policies aimed at social cleansing. Probably you would say, aha, there I caught you. There is no racism under Duterte. But tell, let me tell you this. You don't, you don't have to stick to racism because fascism, if there is a, a, an essential definition of racism across all of this definition is that you can say that a regime is fascist if it divides society into two, like a Manichaean vision. You have the black and the white and there is no in between. So right now, Duterte says you are either for Duterte or you are a communist or a terrorist. And the terrorists or the communists are the last enemies of the state and therefore they have to be eliminated. And all those who aid these terrorists and even sympathize with them are already terrorists. And that is the way to cleanse society. There is no racial cleansing, but ideological cleansing, the cleansing of the right to dissent. Okay, so next uh, slide, please. Okay, now after uh, convincing you that we have a res neoliberal restructuring of higher education and that uh, Duterte or fascism is the best form of uh, government, especially militarized, in order to make uh, neoliberal world order successful, triumphant, unopposed, unresistible. Now we come to the last part. How do we teach in our universities, in our schools, as teachers, as students, in order to, as philosophers and sociologists, to defy this uh, kind of uh, assault on our academic freedom, the assault on our freedom to dissent, the freedom of assembly, the freedom to organize, and the freedom to think differently. Okay. Uh, actually, the, the role of the role of the universities is very critical here. Because the university, the best contribution of the university, if you're going to read the classic uh, lecture of uh, Saint John Henry Newman, Bishop, is that the university is supposed to integrate all this knowledge in the world and create an organic uh, framework so that uh, the students, when they get out of the university, will be able to, to apply uh, and, and, and use this framework to analyze and to read, interpret and understand, comprehend and develop further this knowledge into the outside world. Integrative. That's John Henry Newman. And you know where, where that integrative function of the university education comes in? Liberal arts education. That is the liberal arts education. That is the two years, first year, second year courses that you have to take in common with the rest of all other students coming from different departments and discipline so that you have a common education. We call it general education, but GE or general education is rooted and grounded in liberal arts education. And liberal arts education is to, supposed to liberate the mind. It's from the Latin libertas, liberty. It's from Immanuel Kant's dictum of Aude Sapere, having the courage to use our reason and understanding in order to question all traditions, in order to question everything so that uh, we will not rely on, on, on pre-given knowledge or, or um, uh, wisdom that has been received in the past without, being, uh, without having been uh, interrogated uh, by our uh, by reason or the use or the courage to use uh, reason publicly so that we can criticize uh, the existing uh, state of affairs. And this is also the, the same uh, philosophy of the young Marx when he wrote Ar Arnold, Arnold Ruga in 1841. Ruthless criticism of everything existing. Meaning to say, according to Marx, when you criticize everything, according to this, the best thing that you have to do, according to Marx, is number one, never be afraid of the conclusions that you will arrive at through ruthless criticism. And number two, when these conclusions are in conflict with the powers that be, you should not also back out. You should even pursue more and never be afraid of uh, the ruling, uh, the dominant uh, ideologies that will suppress your conclusions. That is the role of the university, the liberal arts 
university. Okay, so the point is, well, that's the classical definition of liberal arts education of universities and all universities have that, okay? But what is the effect? If neoliberal philosophy, neoliberal ethos cascades, penetrates, enters into the recesses of the ivory tower and academic community, this is what happens. Next slide. This is what happens. Next slide, <laughs> please. We have now liberal arts education under attack. How? Let's come on, look at UP. I'm a product, I'm the very proud product of UP liberal arts education consisting of 45 units of general education, liberal arts, language, humanities, natural sciences, social sciences, philosophy, all integrated like John Henry Newman's vision so that we can create good citizens, engage critical citizens, intelligent citizens to use the words of Arendt. But what, what we have right now when neoliberal ideology creeps into the recesses of uh, the ivory tower is you reduce the numbers and units of your liberal arts. You know why? Because it is useless. Number two, it's too expensive. In other words, you reduce liberal arts to utilitarian values. You reduce education to profit maximization and accumulation of, uh, of uh, to use Bourdieu's term, uh, symbolic capital in the shortest term possible so that you can move on and create and accumulate more outside the university. So there are, when, when in, uh, I think two years ago, there was a debate in the University of the Philippines are we going to cut the number of units for our liberal arts? We tried, to, we tried to depend heroically, but we were powerless. We were railroaded by those from the science department saying that you don't need 45. So we reduce 45, uh, 46 into uh, 19, 21. So from 45, we have 21, 21 units. In other words, if you're going to divide the 21 units into 18 or into two, you only have, uh, I think you will have uh, nine, nine. You can take nine units, 12 units, one semester. You can, finish your new, uh, you can finish your liberal arts education in one year. And after that, you specialize. You take your majors. What happens to our students? Mm. And yet, by cutting that because of neoliberal uh, restructuring, uh, at the same time, neoliberal philosophy says that it's not enough to cut. You have to blend liberal arts education with neoliberal philosophy. And what happens when you blend the two? And this is what happens. By studying liberal arts, the student is educated and subjectivized for a job market that demands flexibility, creativity, autonomy, and responsibility, as well as a specific personality and the desire for self-fulfillment. In other words, neoliberal ideology, philosophy has hijacked, it has transformed, uh, redefined, restructured even liberal arts education that is supposed to liberate the mind so that its end, its outcome, its, its, its main essential structure is now geared towards the production of docile, obedient, unquestioning happy workers to be that we can supply to to transnational companies both local and global okay so the meaning of autonomy Immanuel Kant's autonomy uh, the meaning of creativity uh, the meaning of flexibility has been twisted so that it is now redefined along neoliberal uh, philosophy okay next talk like this. That is why I believe, uh, uh, okay, I believe that uh, it's not enough for us to follow the progressive education, which is very liberal oriented by Dewey. Okay, John Dewey here is on our uh, left side. Uh, what, what we have, a progressive, the father of instrumentalist or progressive education. Progressive education liberal arts education is powerless 
when faced with neoliberal philosophy restructuring, which allows the corporate corporatization and managerialization of the university, meaning the university is now managed like a corporation. Its main function is to create more profits and to attract uh, the best uh, teachers so that it can attract more students and increase its profits. Dewey is powerless if we are just going to rely on Dewey because liberal, uh, liberal education from a Deweyan point of view is simply inculcating students the capacity to think, to interrogate, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, the received traditions. I believe uh, as a sociologist and edu uh, as an educator that we have to move beyond Dewey and embrace social reconstructionism or social reconstructionist philosophy of George Scott's is on the right side here. Uh, it is the only way to neutralize the propensity of neoliberalism to reduce all social problems to individual responsibility. If you fail under a neoliberal system, education tells you it's your fault. It's your problem, not ours. If you drop off from USD, if you are kicked out from UUP, it's not our fault. If you fail to pass the UPCA, it's not it's not our fault. It's not the fault of UP. It's your fault. You did. You are not entrepreneurial enough. You were not resilient enough. And of course, in extreme cases, you kill yourself or the student takes, uh, takes his life. That would be still his problem. Psychological. He has a psychological problem. He has a depression. He cannot cope up with the problem, etc., etc. This means that University should encourage organizing of students and faculty for unions and social civic organize, organize, organization to provide alternative visions of the future. Okay, next po, next slide. Okay, so what kind of pedago pedagogy are we envisioning if we combine the liberal philosophy of education of John Dewey with social reconstructionism? And this is critical pedagogy according to Henry Giroux. This is from his book on critical pedagogy. He says, pedagogy is a mode of critical intervention, one that endows teachers with a responsibility to prepare students, not merely for jobs. I'm not saying we should not prepare students for jobs. Of course, we will be remiss our duties if we do not teach our students how to perform better in their jobs. But that is not the end of education. For being, we have to prepare also our students for being in a world in the world in ways that allow them to influence larger political, ideological, and economic forces that bear down on their lives. In other words, we have to create students who are not just uh, good workers, but engaged, intelligent, active, critical citizens. Schooling is an eminently political and moral practice because because it is directive of and also actively legitimates what counts as knowledge sanctions particular values and constructs particular forms of agency. Therefore, those of you who think that education should be neutral, detached, uh, dispassionate, uh, I think you should I think you're in, uh, I think you're wrong. Uh, the moment uh, you teach, you are already biased, you're already prejudiced. To use Gadamer, uh, you are already historically mediated by your by your poor understand by your poor under, poor understanding. And therefore, you cannot run away from that responsibility. We are all biased. The question is, what kind of bias? We are all prejudiced. Uh, even the Enlightenment that hates prejudice has its own prejudice. And therefore, the question is not whether we can be free of our prejudices as educators. The question is, are you are your prejudices for in, for 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 neoliberalism, or is it for democratic kind of education? Is it for emancipation? or to further the repression that we have right now. Okay, next next slide, please. Okay, so I believe and I agree with uh, Jeffrey, Professor Jeffrey DeLeo when he says, we must build a radical culture in schools that would be hostile to the development of fascist thought and culture. And I think this is, this is what we need right now. We have to create a culture, not only uh, a classroom culture, but an entire culture in our university that is anti-fascist and that can resist fascist onslaughts and attack against uh, academic freedom. The capacity to challenge authority comes from academic subjects who are active and engaged. We have to teach students how to challenge, how to participate, and how to question, and how to interrogate, how to deconstruct 
all of this uh, uh, information, how this knowledge being uh, uh, fed to them by the state or by the government. The docility of the neoliberal academic subject has at its source the authoritarian ideology that is this, the scourge uh, of both the liberal arts in particular and the academy, uh, acad uh, academy in, in, in general. Okay, okay, next slide, please. This is my last slide. If we want to create a non-fascist education, not only non-fascist, but anti-fascist, an education, a pedagogy that defies uh, uh, the currents, the barbarism uh, of uh, attacks of the neoliberal restructuring and neo-fascism in our schools, in our universities, in our campuses, we have to create a culture that will break the silent, uh, the culture of silence. This is from the classic work of Paulo Freire. We have to create students not adaptive to the system, but maladjusted to the current norms. This is from Peter McLaren, uh, my favorite uh, revolutionary pedagogue, not just critical, but revolutionary pedagogue. Uh, we have to create maladjusted abnormal students who are not adjusted and who will not be obedient and not silent in the face of extrajudicial killings, AJK, of human rights violations. It is not just teaching students, but allowing them to engage in the here and now in creating a viable institution to boost our democratic institutions. As Dewey would say, education is not preparation for the future. Education is all about changing our society in the here and now. If you think your philosophy can be used 10 years from now, your philosophy is meaningless and useless. If you think that your algebra cannot be used at this very moment while you are being taught, then your education is just a shit. The role of the university education is not to sanctify or consecrate the powers that be. It is not for, for us to cheer and clap our hands for whatever the government is doing, um, but to interrogate them and expose their foundations and nature. What we need is to promote a culture of question. The breaking of the culture of silence for prayer is the first steps, is the first step towards uh, emancipation and liberation of the masses. If we cannot think, if we refuse to think, if we cower in the face of these threats that we will be arrested, that the police will come to the universities, that we are being monitored right now for this seminar, if we cower in the face of that, then uh, we, we are lost and education, uh, and, and, and education has become meaningless and, and powerless and that all, 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 all channels of the social change and possibility for change has been foreclosed. Or what uh, Marcuse would call as one dimensional society or one dimensional education. Uh, we, have to, we have to oppose and resist that. And I think that's, that's the basic role of the university right now. Uh, I, and, and I hope that my, my lecture tonight has answered the question, what is the role of the university in society and culture? Uh, so, maraming salamat. Thank you very much. And, and that ends my lecture for tonight. Thank you, Dr. Lanuza, for that critical discussion. And to our dear viewers, the floor is now open for your questions, insights, and clarifications. To those who have questions, may we please request for you to click the raise hand button. And once acknowledged, kindly please unmute your mic and open your camera. Okay, we have a question from uh, Mr. Alex Henon. Alex? Um, po, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Lanusa, uh, ako po yung natutuwa sa inyong ibinahagi ngayong gabing ito, lalo-lalo na sa usapin ng edukasyon. Meron lang po ang katanungan at ito po ay galing sa aking curiosity. So, ginoong Lanusa, ano po masasabi ninyo tungkol dito? Saan ba dapat magsimula ang pagbibigay ng restructuring sa edukasyon sa mga bata ba na sa una ay matanong na talaga, nagtatanong pero nawala ang pagtatanong dahil sa, system, sa, sa sistema ng edukasyon na ipinagkakalaw sa kanila o sa mga guro na naging adaptive sa, sa industriya o sa market, uh, tawag dito, sa market thinking ng edukasyon. Saan ba dapat magsimula ang pagbubukas 
ng ating mga mata sa tama at konkretong kahalaga ng edukasyon na pwede nating magamit din sa kung ano ang nangyayari sa lipunan natin ngayon. Yun lang po yung aking katanungan po. Okay, maraming salamat po, uh, Sir Hanon. No? Uh, saan tayo magsisimula? Okay, sociologist ako eh. So, I will not start with the individual because the individual is also a product of society. And and kapag sinabi mong magagaling tayo sa individual, then yari tayo dyan, no? We will fall into the trap of psychologism. We will psychologize everything. Uh, you fail because of your uh, weakness, you are not resilient enough because of your depression, etc., etc., because of your personality traits, and you have to learn how to cope. Uh, that would be neoliberalism. Neoliberalism blames the individual and not, not society. That is why for Margaret Thatcher, uh, society doesn't exist. No? Galing, no? Parang, wow, that's, that's very nominalist. <laughs> Parang Occam's razor, no? Uh, walang nag-e-exist na universal. Ang individual lang ang nag-e-exist. So that is why my, 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 my answer to you will be, you, you have to start with the system. You, you have to start with the system. You know why? Because uh, when you start with the system, then you will be able to understand why is it prevailing? Why, why is this thought style, to use Mannheim, Karl Mannheim's term, why is, it, why is this kind of thinking so common to people at this particular time? Di ba yan ang ano ni Foucault, problematization? Why is it that at this point, at this time, this is the prevailing idea that students should be silent, obedient, that they should not question, that when they question, when they, when the students and children question, they become uh, rebels, and they will become rebels, they become uh, uh, anarchistic, not anarchistic in a philosophical sense, but uh, without, without uh, respect for authority. So I think uh, the, the best way to attack or to answer the problem is to start with uh, the system. Why is it? that this kind of thinking prevails at this particular point in our society. This is what C. Wright Mills also imagination, that you have to connect the individual with history, biography with history. You cannot just look at the failure of the individual. You ask, why is the individual thinking like this? And why is it that there are many other individuals like this, that this one, like this individual, that has also the same thought style or wealth and stew, or worldview, or perspective. And, and, and when, when you begin to, to understand that, why is it that teachers are afraid to unionize? Why is teachers are so afraid to criticize their school administrators? Why is it that teachers, when they are still young, uh, like me in my junior years, I did not question my senior uh, faculty. Uh, it has to do, it, does it have to do with age? It listen na pupyudal yung mga batang, student, mga batang teachers, eh. especially instructors, mga teaching fellows. Eh. Kasi kung lakang tenyo, oh, anong gagawin sa'yo? Ikaw pag gagawin ng minutes of the meeting, eh. aangal ka ba? Of course hindi. Tapos nagtutiro ka sa, sa general education mo ng display, interrogate, uh, ruthless criticism of everything. Pero pagdating sa meeting, wala. Ikaw yung nagnanotes. How, how, how does it happen? How, ba't nangyayari yun? Uh, again, uh, wala eh. Mag-a-adapt ka talaga sa mag-a-adapt ka sa real world na kailangan na patenyo. So ayoko munang kaawayin sila. So makikita mo eh yung dynamics, power dynamics. If you don't start with the individual. Kasi sasabi mo, ay mabait siguro yan. Ay siguro kasi upbringing sa family. Hindi eh. Maari kasing rebelde na to eh. Pero dahil sa feudal, yung sistema sa education, sa, sa university, sa setting, malabas yung kanyang pagiging demonyo, hindi siya nanunuwag. In other words, huwag ka muna manuwag. Manuwag ka, manuwag ka kapag meron ka ng PhD. So in other words, kapag PhD candidate, sumunod ka sa iyong advisor. Pag PhD ka na, awayin mo na advisor mo. Ganun yun eh. Sa so, makikita mo, yung patients. Hindi lang ito problema ng individual. Systemic yan eh. The university is feudal. May isa pang ang buka kong nabasa, revitalization of the... Kasi nga maraming walang tenure. O, oh, pinapower trip sila ngayon ng may mga tenure at mga matatandang faculty. Mga senior. Oh, we should not that. Kasi ang, ang university is supposed to produce democratic 
Di ba? Democratic community. Well, of course, if you follow Habermas. Eh, paano kung hindi na? Ano na yan? Hindi na siya university. Ano na siya? Parang family. O, oh, di ba? Authoritarian na rin ba? So, yun ang sagot ko sa inyo, sir. Uh, tignan natin yung kabuuan muna. Saka tayo mag-zero in. It is only by studying the whole, the structure, that will be able to situate the individual within the wider frame from which he or she uh, moves. So, hindi naman ang freedom ay either or. Eh. You either have it or you don't. Degrees. Ang pinag-uusapan natin dito, degrees of freedom. Ano siya nag-negotiate? All of this uh, constraints and enabling uh, conditions. So yun po, sir. Um... Thank you, Dr. Lanusa. Alex, do you have a follow-up question or comment? Comment ako. Napakaganda po ng inyong nasabi ni uh, Dr. Lanusa na na natutunan ko ngayong araw na ito, tingnan ang sistema bago ang individual. At ito po ay aking talagang uh, pumukos sa isipan ko ngayon. Kasi nagtatalo po talaga sa isipan ko eh. Uh, sistema. Pero naging klaro po para sa akin ngayong gabing ito na kailangan talagang tingnan ang sistema. At may babago ng kaunti sa sistema ng sa ganun, aayon din ang tao na nasa loob ng sistema. Maraming maraming salamat po, sir. Salamat, sir. Salamat. Uh, pahabol lang, sir, ha? Kasi pag inipasais na naman natin ni Debil na neoliberal philosophy, Oo. sabi nga ng simbahan, kahit ang simbahan, anti-neoliberal. Kasi naniniwala ang simbahan, may social sin. Eh. So, hindi lang, hindi lang siya individual sin. Siguro, kung isa lang yung nangungopya sa klase, individual sin. Pero kung yung buong klase mo na ay... 90% ng mga estudyante ay nangungodigot, nangungopya ay structural sin na yan there is something wrong with the school there is some, no, there is something wrong with the teacher there is something with, with the, the section the class. so and yeah, salamat sa po maraming salamat din po sir thank you Alex and thank you Dr. Danuza uh, we have a comment from Dr. Paolo Bolaños Dr. Pao Hello, uh, thank you, Aldrin. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lanusa. Um, uh, thank you, sir, for, for sharing with us your uh, thoughts on the uh, impact of neoliberalism on education, specifically on Philippine education. Um, I, I, the, I have, well, the first one is a comment, but I have a question. I have the second one is, is a question. Um, um, I, I don't have a problem with your use of the term neo-fascism to characterize forms of government that demonstrate, whether overtly or covertly, militaristic tendencies. As a matter of fact, I agree with you when you said that we, per, we are perhaps under martial law. Uh, and we, uh, my view is that uh, we don't need to declare martial law in order, in order to be under martial law, uh, especially with uh, the uh, approval of um, the anti-terror bill, the, we don't need to declare martial law anymore. Um, uh, and so I agree with you on that point. However, I think that uh, one of the uh, essential characteristics of neo-fascism today is precisely its subscription to a kind of populism uh, that is made more ubiquitous by social media and technology. So sa tingin ko, uh, magkasama yan eh. Hindi, hindi natin siya mahiwalay. And so, uh, um, I think a neo-fascist regime would have to subscribe to that kind of uh, to, that, to that brand of populism, you know, yung uh, populism that is uh, in, in social media. And nabagit nyo rin kanina yung uh, proliferation of fake news and, and, and ang tag dito yung mga uh, soldier of, soldier, uh, tag dito yung uh, platoon of, uh, uh, tag dito yung mga trolls, right? Um, so yun lang, this is just a, a, a comment. Um, uh, maybe a supplemental comment, but the, but the second one is a question um, because uh, towards the end of your of your talk, you talk about 
uh, you mentioned your experiences in UP. It seems to me that we are all, whether we are we come from private or uh, public uh, institutions, it seems to me that we are all haunted by the same issues uh, that emerge because of, of of neoliberal, you know, restructuring, as you pointed out. All of us are experiencing the anti-intellectualism symptomatic of the neoliberal agenda. And despite, however, despite this common experience, the neoliberal agenda still dominates our, our relationship as HEIs uh, in as much as we continue to compete for phantom ranking badges. Um, I think what is lacking is a collective discourse among academics from different Philippine universities. In other words, we should stop uh, competing for you know, ranking badges, no? Uh, parang, it doesn't matter if we come from UP or UST or from Ateneo or from La Salle. Um, uh, so, so in other words, I'd like to seek your opinion on how specifically we could come together collectively as Filipino academics, no? How could we come together collectively in order for us to express our intolerance? Um, well, organizing a conference like this is just a, it's just a small step. Uh, and my problem is that after this conference, and I mentioned in my opening remarks earlier that our department is actually advocating, uh, advocating this uh, uh, vigilant um, critique of uh, the, 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 as you pointed out, the neoliberal, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 the impact of neoliberalism in, in education. Pero may ramifications din yun eh. Uh, specifically, we are in UST, our department is uh, criticizing, uh, let's say, um, um, our, for example, yung, uh, yung I call this uh, fascination with metrics, for example. Uh, and yung, yung uh, com competition for ranking badges, which I think, uh, you know, um, let, it, it, because we, we play the game, we forget what is fundamental, you know, the, what, is, what is important and what, what is not important in education. So uh, aside from organizing this kind of confidence, then my question is, uh, how could we, come together collectively, you know, uh, despite of, uh, rather, despite the fact that we come from different institutions. Uh, kasi we come together as, as one. So, yun lang po, yung aking, uh, baka meron lang kayong uh, opinion tungkol dyan, um, or suggestion, and maybe we could uh, uh, continue our collaboration. Okay. Thank you. Marami salam, marami salamat sa Sir Bolaños. Uh, that's that's very true, no? Tama tama 'yon. Napakaganda ng uh, tanong ni Sir at saka suggestion. Ah, uh, yung sinasabi ni Sir na ang ang emphasis ko kasi sa the definition ko ng uh, neo-fascism is more military. Eh. Pero tama si Sir, no? Uh, nalimutan mo kang hindi ko na emphasize yung populist side niya. Which is very true, no? Si Trump yung mga maga no uh, make america great again yung inestorm nila yung yung capital si si bolsonaro sa brazil sa si ano no sa sa turkey tsaka sa india ito yung mga si putin si putin, si putin no si putin at tsaka si xi jinping mga populist diyan eh na authoritarian so tama i agree ako doon in fact uh, yung masusuportahan pa yung in an analysis ni sir doon kay Pinkelstein, no? Nagsulat din siya kasi on fascism at sinasabi niya na the populist uh, character of fascism right now is already the result of the, ano, yung bang nasira kasi yung image ng fascism kay Mussolini at saka kay Hitler noong uh, 40s, 50s, eh, sa Italy and Germany and Europe. So bumabalik siya ngayon in the form of populist uh, uh, authoritarianism. So agree ako doon sir. Uh, tama yun. As to the question na uh, uh, how, how do we as academics come together uh, para labanan yan. Uh, tama yun. Uh, alam mo sir, yung line ng thinking mo ay George Counts. No? 
na hindi tayo pwedeng number one you cannot isolate the university from the larger society kaya nga yung team ng uh, theme ng critique ay the role of the university in society and culture uh, so you cannot isolate the university number two of course the university cannot be the vanguard for liberating society Sabi ni Prairie yan, no? you, you, you can't say that the university will liberate uh, the Philippine society or the world from neoliberal capitalism. No, it cannot. That's, that's utopian. That's idealism. But nevertheless, uh, you cannot also liberate the society without education, without the university. So, hindi naman tayo messianic. So, pero tama yung suggestion ni sir. Uh, how do we uh, come together? Maybe we can, we can arrange a conference and from there we can, we can, ano, we can create an association for the defense of academic freedom against neoliberal reforms. Siguro pwede nating mapag-usapan dyan yung tenure system kasi yan ang talagang yun ang problema ng mga batang co-faculty natin. Na 10 years na sila, hindi pa natin tenure. Or under the pandemic, siguro sana hindi nyo naranasan to. Marami tayong mga uh, junior faculty na delayed yung sahod. Na delayed, no? Grabe, no? Months na wala silang kita at wala sila. Niiyak na yung nag-breakdown na iba eh. Na uh, uh, maririn nyo ba kami? Ito yung, yung mga ganon. Uh, I think uh, nagka- nagkikreate din siya ng anxieties eh sa mga faculty natin. Uh, so we can we can come together uh, to, for that. Uh, siguro ang, ang kaisahan lang natin doon ay we are against neoliberal uh, assault and uh, marching and opening of the university to uh, neoliberal reforms. Or kung nandyan na, na-reforma na, uh, how do we curtail that? Uh, may paper nga ako dito sa conference at uh, nabanggit ko doon yung obsession. Tama si sir. Yung obsession natin sa competencies, uh, matrix. Kami sa UP, my God. No? Minamadali kami sa course packs kasi online. So kung hindi tayo makapag-online kasi walang internet, pantala mo yung course packs, modules, na para bang ito ba yung pagiging effective teacher? <laughs> Masusukat malingan ko bilang isang sociology guru dahil ako ay nakagawa ng course packs. Pag may course packs ba ako ay sigurado na ito na natututo yung aking mga estudyante. Synchronous and uh, asynchronous. Um, yun, no? Minsan, yung mga estudyante pa natin, dahil naturuan din yung mga estudyante natin ng neoliberal na pananaw na maging competitive, ragged individualist. Uh, wow. Minsan, yung kinikriticize pa kaming faculty, tayo, at sinasabi nila na, Sir, magbigay ka pa ng modules? Parang, <laughs> may pandemic, may problema yung pamilya mo, gusto mo pa talagang dagdagan ko yung requirements mo, ha? <laughs> Parang, bakit? Paramihan ba to? Paramihan pa tayo ng papel? Pakapalan tayo ng credentials? Um, what has happened to us? Kasi akala ko yung philosophy is the love of wisdom. Bakit love of, ano na ito? Love of ranking, sabi niya sir. Obsession with ranking. Kahit pandemic, kailangan tayo mag-produce na mag-produce. Publish or perish. Otherwise, hindi ka mapopromote. Ayan, yung problema sa amin, promotion, kailangan. Pag mapopromote ka, at least nakapublish ka ng one journal, uh, one journal article, dapat pa-referee. Preferably international. Diba? Sa UP, binibigyan pa kami ng monetary award. Pag nakapublish ka, may monetary award ka eh. Para tuloy inisip mo, ayaw ka lang magpublish sa local. Gusto ka lang magpublish international kasi may monetary award. My God, yung love of learning mo, asa na? This system... The system is corrupting. Nakaka-corrupt talaga siya. Na kung hindi malakas, kaya yung maganda yung sinasabi ni sir eh, kung magsama-sama tayo, we can have a collective voice at pwede nating uh, i-resist as a collective body. Kasi ang purpose naman talaga ng neoliberalism is to divide. Uh, divide us, make us compete with one another. To privatize our problems. So, ang the best way to neutralize that is to we come together. Uh, as a public sphere and depend uh, the dignity of the university against commercialization, marketization, at financialization. So, yun. Yun ang maganda sana. No? Uh, Tapos, man-nurture natin yung culture of learning the love of wisdom. 
and sharing sa bawat isa ng resources, intellectual or otherwise, para sa ganun. So, yun sir, kung, kung ano, open naman kami na makapagbukas tayo at makagawa tayo nito. Specifically, siguro, society against uh, neoliberal reform or society for the defense of or teachers, a society of teachers for the defense of academic freedom against uh, neoliberalism. At maraming, oy, maraming jo-join sa atin dyan, sir. Uh, so, suporta ako. Thank you, Dr. Lanusa. Actually, as a matter of fact, uh, we and we in the department are already thinking along those lines. Uh, that's why uh, I don't want to announce it here, but uh, uh, or I don't want to announce the details. But uh, we are actually uh, organizing a conference, uh, which has something to do with that precisely. Yung coming together collectively as academics. No. Uh, uh, and since we, as a department, we are uh, celebrating our anniversary, uh, 10th year anniversary, as a matter of fact, this year, or uh, this academic year, uh, uh, we are organizing that to, you know, to, um, um, to cap off our celebration. So hopefully you will be able to um, join us, siguro, kasi yun naman aming advocacy. Um, uh, yun ang nakikita kong kulang pa sa atin as a community of scholars. We know the problem but uh, pinag-uusapan natin yan locally with our colleagues, with our immediate colleagues but there is no national um, parang discourse yet. No? Kaya sana ma-elevate doon para uh, ano, uh, ma- siguro we could uh, uh, no, not well. Ex- not only express our intolerance, but uh, maybe also um, share um, alternatives. No, um, so salamat po, salamat. Thank you, Doctor Blanios, and thank you, Doctor Lanusa, for your great response. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Mark Joseph Landingin. According to him. Uh, isn't the investment mentality of parents of their children inherent in the Filipino or at least a Chinese mestizo culture and not necessarily from neoliberal ideology? Or is this just another neoliberal or neo-fascist ploy? Who are the neoliberals in the Philippines besides seemingly P-dots and friends as in yung public intellectual or yung systemic yung neoliberalism sa Pinas? That's his question. Okay, salamat sa uh, salamat sa tanong, no? Uh, tama naman yung tanong. Uh, sa tingin ko uh, I think it's it's quite natural for parents to uh, really uh, care for their uh, children, especially for their future. And they will do everything uh, including supporting them to finish their education, their studies uh, para mas malaki yung kanilang capital accumulated, no? Pero in general yan. Pero kung titignan mo si Pierre Bourdieu sa analysis niya ng uh, capital grounded sa family habitus, uh, makikita mo na mas malakas yan sa middle class. Yung middle class kasi talagang gusto niyang ma-insure na nauuna sa karera yung anak niya. Parang karerang daga. So, bibigyan niya lahat ng subsidy yan. Tutor, common na mat, uh, ballet, tutor, uh, tutoring, karate, Taekwondo, lahat. Ibibigay niya yan. Violin. Mm. Para angat sa lagi eh. Kasi parating competitive yung middle class uh, parents. Pero kung tignan mo yung lower class parents, families, wala. They don't care about that. Kasi wala silang resources eh. At alam nila na limited yung mararating ng kanilang mga anak. Is it Chinese? Well, kung babasahin mo yung uh, literature sa achievements ng Asian sa United States. Totoo na mas matataas ang educational achievement, aspirations, as well as performance, scholastic performance ng mga Asians, especially Chinese. Hindi lahat ng Asians sa Chinese. Again, it has to do with the family values. So in this case, you have a middle class plus the classical Confucian, uh, Confucian ethic of uh, family uh, filial uh, piety. And, and, and values uh, con- uh, nagko-compound 
para itulak yung bata para maging uh, competitive. Tapos, middle class ka, uh, yung family mo ay competitive pa at may values predisposed to that. Nasa isang environment ka pa na individualistic, na uh, neoliberal yung pananaw, ay yung subjectivity, how it defines subjectivity. Wow, matindi talaga yan. Kaya yung iba ay nagbe-breakdown eh. Pag hindi kaya eh. Marami akong estudyanteng ganyan, especially from engineering department. From engineering, from the college of engineering. Galing sila sa Philippine Science High School, enter UP, talitalino. Tapos biglang ah, bagsak sa isang class, sa math. Wala na. Depress na sila eh. Kasi na, doon nakatoon yung kanilang buhay eh. How to be on top, how to be number one how to be competitive. I don't think, again, this is a general uh, historical anthropological question. By nature ba tayo ay competitive? Not no, hindi. Hindi. From the very beginning, kung babasahin mo yung anthropological literature, we did not live as individuals. Kahit yung sinasabi ni John Jacques Rousseau sa kanyang state of nature na noble savage ay fiction. Kahit yung kay Thomas Hobbes na uh, homo lupus or uh, uh, omnia contra bellum omnes the war call against everyone against everybody eh, hindi naman nag-exist yan sa ano eh sa mga prehistoric uh, societies no cooperative tayo eh it is only capitalism that really corrupted uh, uh, our nature and uh, uh, yung yung nature naman natin yung human nature naman natin ang bago nag adjust so yung family values mo may may impluwensya yan i agree with you yung ethnic ethnicity mo, yung ethnic background mo, yes, may, may ano yan. Pero ang matinding overdetermined yan, sabi ni Althusser, in the long, in the in the final analysis, economic. Mm, kasi you have to secure your status in the family, in the community, and maintain your uh, standard doon sa, sa clan at sa wider society. Mm, uh, Kaya maganda yung tanong eh. Kasi sa tingin ko, uh, hindi lang tina, hindi lang hindi lang ang dagok ng neoliberalism ay kahirapan, no? Psychological. Nakaka-depress. Nakakasira ng mental health yan. <laughs> Oo. Lalo na kapag iniisip mo lagi na kasalanan ko to. Uh, hindi kasalanan ni mama, hindi kasalanan ng, ng UP, ng UST, ng school. So, yun. So, uh, yun po ang aking... Okay, thank you, Dr. Lanuza, and thank you, Mark, for the question. Uh, we have another one from Mr. Jim Lester Beleno. Uh, according to him, uh, good evening, Doc. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization states, education cannot wait. If learning stops, we will lose human capital, UNESCO 2017. What is your take on this statement by UNESCO, which is highlighted by DepEd in implementing what they call the new normal education in this time of pandemic? Thank you, Doc. Uh, yes, totoo yun. Uh, according to UNESCO, then, no? millions of children are affected by the lockdown. Not only that, uh, yung, nag, yung drop out rates ay tumaas. Ang, ang tinatamaan talaga nito yung mga may hirap at mga kababaihan. Girls. Girls are left behind because of this pandemic, of this lockdown. Mag-iisang taon na yung lockdown natin, no? March, March 16. Uh, totoo yun. Uh, education cannot wait. Uh, so, hindi rin kami nag-advocate. Ako, halimbawa, sabi natin na uh, uh, let's wait for the vaccine. May ganun, eh. may, di ba? May ganun panawagan during the height of the pandemic. Wag na muna tayong klase. Uh, we of course we 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 fought for end the semester, but ending the semester there is 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 not does not equate with uh, not non education or 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 side stepping education or binabali wala natin ang edukasyon. Ang sinasabi lang natin is that uh, mar- marami pa namang paraan para matuto yung mga bata, no? Other than that, ikalawa hindi naman natin sila sabing wag na mag-aral. Uh, ang problema kasi natin, sige, education cannot wait. Yes, uh, we cannot be normal. We cannot be, we cannot study under normal normal situation kasi sa pandemic. But the question is, do we have the resources? Yan ang yung sinasabi ko eh, sa una kong part ng, ng, ng lecture ko kanina. We are in the port industrial revolution, knowledge society, 
electronic mediated technology, computer based technology, internet based. Oh. How how do we how do we proceed? Na buksan ng education mo kung yung deaf ed mo <laughs> walang subsidy sa sa teachers. Yung modules mo ay kulang ang pera mo para mag-reproduce dyan. In fact, maraming ang private schools, alam nyo yan, mga taga-private schools, alam, maraming nagsara. Yung iba nga, 50 years na in operation, biglang nagsara eh. Nakakalungkot at nakakaiyak, di ba, na lalo na yung mga, mga alumna nun, alumni, na wow, nagsara yung school namin. Yung ibang ang alumni, nag-aambaga na para lang mai, maipagpatuloy ng school, private school, yung kanilang ano eh. I think, again, Bakit yung government, hindi niya masubsidize yan? Number two, but hindi niya masubsidize yung mga private te- uh, teachers sa private schools? Bakit kami lang na nasa public? Eh wala din namang pera itong mga private schools kasi nagaling din sa tuition ng mga estudyante. So you want education? You want to continue under normal uh, condition, even under pandemic? You have to provide all the materials modules, uh, internet connection, laptop, gadgets, including ano, financial assistance, as well as mass testing, swab testing para sa mga teachers na lumalabas para kumuha ng modules at mag-deliver. If you cannot do that, kawawa, wala. Impossible na magpatuloy ang education. Oh. So, hindi naman, hindi ko naman, hindi naman natin sinasabi na huwag na tayong magturo sa pandemic, Pina- ginawa natin. Heroic nga yung teachers natin. Sila nga yung frontliners. Eh. Oh, at alam ko, marami kayong kwento tungkol sa, on- sa mga inyong mga online class at isang conference din yun. Uh, <laughs> so, tama. I agree. Uh, hindi dapat maputol ang education. Bakit? Sa isang araw, sa isang linggo, sa isang buwan, nawala tayong education. Wow. Ang laki ng nawawala sa mga bata in terms of their intellectual, cognitive, uh, aptitude uh, development. Ang laki nang nawawala doon. Ang laki nang kawalan. Kaya hindi pwedeng sabihin na, sabi ni Duterte noon, eh, wala tayong edukasyon, di tayong magbubukas hanggat walang vaccine. Uh, patay tayo doon. No. Somehow, we have to find ways on how to, ano. Kasi kawawa dyan yung, ano, eh, yung mga mahihirap. Yung mga mayayaman at middle class na mga anak, magpapachutor yan eh. At meron niyang mga access sa gadgets, sa internet, at ang bibilis ng access niyan. Umaabot pa ng mga 60, 250 Mbps yan eh. Eh yung mga may hirap, walang signal, karag-karag yung cellphone, yung laptop niya ay hindi pa umaabot ng Core i3, baka nga hindi pa Core i1 yan or mas mababa pa. At ang tagal magbukas, di ba? Dahil Intel seller lang yung gamit niya. Oh. Si ma'am, ganun din, si ma'am. Paano si ma'am sa public school? Oh, binigyan ba siya ng laptop? Hindi. Oh, so, yun ang mga problema natin. Uh, ipagpatuloy natin ang edukasyon. Pero kailangan ang gobyerno mo ay mag-subsidize. Because education is a public good. It is not a private good na pwede mo siyang... It's, it's, it's not something... Akom- hindi siya commodity na pwede mo siyang i-trade. No. Public good dyan eh. Ayaw mong gastusan yung mga mga estudyante natin? Pa, bakit ano? Para maging mangmang paglaki? Ano gusto mo? Mangmang o pera? <laughs> Again, new liberalism will say, no, we cannot do that. Uh, walang pera ang gobyerno. Walang pera. Dami-dami utang sa China. Dami-dami natin utang sa China. Eh. Kaya nga hindi natin sila ma- masaway doon sa West Philippine Sea. O, oh, dahil sa utang. By the way, we have 86,900 per, uh, per per person ang utang natin. Kung i-divide natin lahat ng utang ng government ngayon, 86,000. Hindi lang kayo may utang, pati anak nyo. At mga apo ng anak nyo at anak ng anak nyo. Oh, ganun katindi yan. And yet, wala tayong magandang education. Wala tayong magandang school. Ang masakit pa niyan, kasa, uh, kapatid, no? bago na pandemic ang yabang ng DepEd at Ched. We are globally competitive. We are now prepared for the 21st century. Tapos biglang nag-pandemic. Pak! O, oh, nakita natin. Prepared pala. Ha? <laughs> prepared pala. Oh, asan ang preparation nyo? Wala pala. We were caught. Uh, flat-footed. Wala tayo. 
So, yun po. Uh, yun lang masasabi ko dyan. Thank you, Dr. Nuza. I think we can still entertain one more question, uh, one last question. Uh, according to Ian Gabriel, where do we draw the line between Burgi's family competitive paradigm and family fundamental cooperative values? It seems hard to nuance the two, especially in a so-called neoliberal society. Should we use solely socioeconomic criterion as a standard in analysis of family values? Would that suffice, Dr. Lanuza? Okay. Uh, uh, kung ikaw ay kumukuha ng uh, philosophy or sociology of education, uh, si Jean Ann yun, ang basahin mo rito. No? Napakaganda nung uh, bi- uh, sinulat niya dyan. No? Uh, yung tungkol kay uh, ginamit niya si Pierre Bourdieu para pag-aralan niya yung uh, difference. Actually, meron din Basil Bernstein, pero symbolic at linguistic yung approach. So, kinumpara niya yung lower class at middle class families. So, anong lumabas sa comparison? No? Lumalabas na yung middle class families ay talagang competitive, individualistic yung training niya. Kasi sa simula pa lang, ang vision ng mga middle class families is to rear their children in such a way that they're always ahead. Pati yung language nila eh, is geared towards abstract thinking. Hindi tulad sa lower class na restricted code, sabi ni Bernstein. Restricted code ang ginagamit na language ng lower class. Eh. Masyado siyang narrow, tapos pang ano lang siya, very specific, uh, contextual yung, yung, yung uh, boundary ng kanyang language. Ang masaklap nito, pagdating mo sa school, middle class yung kinagamit na background. So yung middle class family, ito pa ha, ang mga middle class family, individualistic, at the same time, assertive yan sa rights. Kaya yung uh, revolution at yung accountability, transparency ng government, nagagaling sa middle class yan eh, sa result ng kanilang education. Kasi mga professional yung parents eh. So the more professional your parents is, kung dalawa parehas, doktor yung parent, parents mo or teachers, ay ma, 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 very probable na ma-imbibe mo yung ganong klase ng sistema sa kanila. Na competitive ka din, hihigitan mo yung kung ang tatay mo ay teacher lang, siguro ikaw principal o kung principal ang tatay mo, mag-PhD ka at magiging director ka ng DepEd sa regional. So may ganong klase ng, ano, no? ng, ng uh, track sa leader class. How about poor class? Sabi ni Pierre Bourdieu at ni Jean Anion, sa lower class, uh, makikita mo rin yan kay Paul Willis, no? learning to labor. Kung babasahin mo yung books, mga books na ito, ang, ito ang ipapakita niya sa'yo. Yung, middle class, yung lower class kids, they resist education. They resist because they know na wala naman sila talagang pupuntahan. Ang gandun lang sila eh. So tanangin mga mga lower class na nasa K-12. Ang sasabihin niya, hindi naman ako magka-college eh. Ang sasabihin pa ng mga ambisyon, gusto ko maging model, gusto ko maging security guard, gusto ko maging tricycle driver, taxi driver, bus driver. Yun ang magiging ano niya, aspiration. I'm not saying lahat ay ganun. And I'm, I'm not saying dinidimin ko sila ha. Hindi naman kasi yun in, innate or hindi naman yun ano yan, Cartesian uh, innate ideas. Yung kay Kant na a priori na galing sa kanila. No. Tinanong, tinanim ng lipunan sa kanila yun na hanggang doon ka na lang eh. So, wala ka na masyadong aspirations. Oh. Ngayon, siguro na-demarcate ko na sa'yo kung ano ang public positions, psychological positions ng personality, psychological, nung lower at middle class. Now, punta sila sa school. What happens? Patay ka dyan. Kasi yung school mo, ang language na ginagamit, middle class, which is elaborated code, sabi ni Basil Bernstein. Kaya, pag nag-compete yung estudyante galing sa lower at middle, obviously, the outcome would be favorable to the middle class. Kaya sabi ni Bourdieu at ni Jean Passeron, the school is the greatest reproducing machine in society. Nare-reproduce niya yung inequalities eh, without us knowing that. Pagkos may mag- magkikwestiyon sa inyo na, ay sir, may kilala ako, security guard, naging lawyer. Sir, yung taga-UST nga, sir, taga-UP. Yung, yung nanay niya, labandera, naging doktor. Of course, may mga ganyan. Pero ang galing nung analysis ni Bordeaux dyan, eh. sabi ni Bordeaux, of course, may lalabas na ganyan. If only for the, for the system to make it appear <laughs> na hindi siya biased. 
na meron parang ano yan eh, na, na meron pala namang possibility na matupad yung pangarap ko. But that is the policy of composition. What is true for one is not necessarily true, true, true for all. Hindi porke naging lawyer yung isang security guard, lahat ng security guard ay magiging lawyer. Not necessarily. At ito yung dominant ideas na makikita mo sa mass media, di ba? Tuwing graduation. Nagkahanap sila ng i-interviewin. Pilay, naging piloto. Pilay, naging pintor. Uh, dating uh, basurero, naging uh, ano, naging <laughs> engineer, tapos sasabi, tapos bibigyan tayo ng, pa, ng pangarap ng false false hope na uh, si pagat saka uh, bilyar, di ba? Oh, so ibig sabihin security guard ako, hindi ako naging lawyer. Anong problema ko? Ba't hindi ako naging lawyer? Wala ka kasi si pagat saka eh. Oh, bulak-bulak ka kasi nung bata ka eh. Oh. Okay lang sana kung ikaw na bulak-bulak eh. But the point is, ang daming dropouts, millions of out of, out of school youth. Ibig mo sabihin, lahat yun, bulakbot. Lahat yun, walang pangarap sa buhay. Lahat sila ay tamad. Ayan, lalabas na yung psychologism. Reducing everything to psychological uh, characteristics ng mga ng mga estudyante, ng mga teachers. Ayan, hindi ka kasi nagsipag. Ayan, hindi ka naka-MA. Ayan, kasi lumandi ka ng maaga, nabuntis ka ng maaga. Ayan, hindi ka nakatapos. Yung mga ganun, eh, kahit naman mabuntis yan, pwede naman natin siyang suportahan para para makatapos. If only the government has a program for teenage pregnancy para sila ay makatapos. Chatana. So sana na, nakita mo yung demarcation. Ha? Uh, class-based yan. Eh. Pero hindi class ang ginamit ni Bordeaux. Eh. Habitus. Pero kitang-kita mo yung tagos ng economic resources dyan. At hindi lang kasalanan yan. Kasalanan ng bata at pinanganak siyang middle class. At ganun yung values na. Ang question ay, mababago ba yon? Yes. Yung lower class ba, mababago? Yung kanyang pananaw, yung kanyang habitus o predisposition? Yes. Kung ikaw ay anak ng taxi driver o poli, uh, jeepney driver, nag-aral ka, pinag-aral ka sa isang exclusive school na Catholic, na private, mababago yan. At yung check ng mga next generation ng, ng pamilya nyo, ng anak mo, ay may imbibe naman yung middle class values na nakuha mo na from that education. So parang ang cycle. Is that such a middle class mag-isip? No. Hindi. Ang problema mo again is not the psychological habitus as predisposition. But the question is the system. It is the system that reproduces the habitus. The distribution of symbolic, economic, uh, social capital. Yun ang problema. Yun ang dapat mong baguhin para magbago yan. So, yun lang po. Thank you, Dr. Lanusa, for a good answer. And to our dear audience, I know that you have a lot, lots of questions that you want to clarify with Dr. Lanusa. But unfortunately, we have to officially close the floor for the other questions due to time constraints. If you have further questions, you can send an email to... Dr. Lanusa, and I believe he will be more than willing to respond to those questions. So, Dr. Lanusa, thank you very much.